Hello everyone and welcome to the Cloud Mask webinar. I'll be your host Mubarak Bujra. So today's topic will be using public cloud was complying with the EU data protection framework. Your speakers for today will be Mr. Robert Vaughn from Speechy Bircham. Uh, Robert is a partner, notary public, and certified compliance and ethics professional at Speechly Bircham. He is internationally recognized legal expert and author in the fields of data protection, information security, and cyber risks. Following him, will we hear from Mr. Tarek Al-Jilani from CloudMask. Tarek is Chief Technology Officer of CloudMask. He is a worldwide information security, matter, security subject matter expert with more than 20 years of industry experience. Just to give a brief agenda of what we'll hear about today. So Mr. Robert will talk about data protection laws as it applies to the US, the EU, and, uh, and Asia. Uh, following that, Mr. Tarek will talk to us about cloud challenges and some solutions. After all of that, we'll have a short Q&A. And just to remind you, any time during the presentation, you can write down questions on the side and we'll address them at the end. So Robert, if you wish, please start any time. Thank you very much indeed, and um, I appreciate being on this uh, webinar today. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, in the next 20 minutes is to take you through um, the legal and regulatory issues of using uh, public cloud whilst complying with the EU data protection framework. So in terms of the current issues, I think it goes without saying that data and information is at the heart of any business, whether you're dealing with commercial contracts, big data, Internet of Things, uh, outsourcing, and of course, public and private cloud, or dealing with investigations, with email and use of social media in the workplace, mergers and acquisitions, investigations, reporting and discovery, Inevitably, almost all of these things will involve some movement or processing of personal data. When we look at the cloud, uh, what are the current concerns that we tend to think of? Well, one might be who is responsible for protecting personal data uh, when it is being used in a cloud environment. Is it the cloud host? Is it the owner of the data? To what extent is it the individual's responsibility to have concerns over their own uh, personal information? Since the cloud is by definition everywhere, one of the other challenges is what is the applicable law and what's the applicable jurisdiction in which you would bring a claim if you found that there had been a data breach or misuse of your personal data in the cloud? And then what are the contractual issues? Uh, all too often when we're using public cloud, there is no contract negotiation. Uh, it is a click-through process, almost with a take it or leave it uh, over the issues of warranties, indemnities, liability, or limitation of liability. And that is a particular issue for the public cloud, perhaps uh, less so for, pub for private cloud, where there is an opportunity to be more involved in negotiating the terms and conditions. Another issue is, what is the legal basis for processing data within the cloud? Uh, do you have the consent of individuals to use a cloud forum uh, or cloud framework within which to process their data? If you don't have the permission, certainly under the EU laws, then putting personal data, particularly sensitive personal data, into a public cloud might well infringe the rights of individuals and make you, the data controller, a definition which I'll turn to in a minute, uh, liable for what happens to the data in the cloud. There's also this issue of is anonymization or de-identification or pseudonymization a suitable method for protecting personal data. Uh, because you can't see the personal data because you've anonymized it, uh, on the one hand, you might argue that it's no longer personal data if you can't see it. On the other hand, there are regulators that say, if you encrypt data, but there is somebody else in possession of the decryption key, it's still personal data. 
again, because of the global nature of the cloud, uh, international data transfers and the regimes legally that are necessary to legitimize international transfers become important. Of course, data security is as important an issue as ever, particularly in a world where there is governmental intervention in personal data, there's uh, uh, nation-state hacking, there's uh, politically motivated hacking, and just plain forward operator error. All these are things which raise the stakes. And then there's questions about where is the data being stored? Uh, where is the server or are the servers? How long is the data being stored for? Is it permissible to store it forever, or should there be controls over the length that data can be stored? And what about destruction? What about obligations on the data controller to destroy data if it is necessary, uh, whether the data controller wants to do it or somebody exercises this dreaded right to be forgotten that we've heard so much about? And then there's also the question of how do you audit and monitor and manage risk when the data that you are responsible for is now being managed by someone else. And then, of course, the data breaches. Within the EU, we have an organization some of you will know called the Article 29 Data Protection Working Party, which in essence is the committee that is made up of all of the regulators in the EU. And they publish opinions, and I've just put one up here, which was a specific opinion published in 2012 on the challenges of cloud computing and similar services as regards data protection. And again, looking at what we have on the slide, there were two main risks. One was lack of control over the data, and the other lack of information on the data processing activities. There's also within this opinion some very useful guidance on what are the duties and responsibility of cloud clients as data controllers and cloud providers as data processors, a definition I'll talk about again in a minute, and also subcontractors. And then again, the other items on here I've really mentioned already, which is the contract, privacy principles, international data transfers, uh, how to manage and analyze risk, and where the future may be going within cloud. I've been particularly asked to talk uh, about the new regulation that is coming down the tracks in the EU, which again ups the ante for data controllers to manage personal data in the cloud. But before I do that, I thought it would be useful to do a comparison of some of the key concerns between the US, between, the, between Europe, and between Asia. So by way of reminder, uh, in the US, there is no one law. There are 20 sector-specific laws and many, many state laws, and I've given some examples. Compare that with Europe, and you have a data protection directive at the moment, which is interpreted by 28 member states in 28 different ways, and I've just given three examples of, of the names of the law in Germany and the UK and Italy. And then in Asia, there is an, in, there is an increasing amount of data protection law but loosely based on the European directive, <clears throat> partly because if you look at Malaysia uh, and Singapore, they were both at one point uh, British occupied and therefore there's a big UK influence. If you look at Vietnam, uh, there is a major French influence. And perhaps the most draconian one is, is South Korea's data protection law, uh, about which there's almost an entire webinar in its own right. For the purposes of the risks in public cloud, let's look at the comparisons between security and breach notifications where in the US there is a history of major investigations and fines around data breaches. Uh, HIPAA for the health sector has particularly uh, detailed uh, regimes and regulations. And breach notifications are a major issue for businesses that are managing personal identifiable information in the US. 
compare that to Europe, and whilst we have laws which say we need security, both technical uh, and organizational, uh, there is no mandatory data breach notification requirement except in the telecom sector, but that, of course, is about to change. Asia is catching up, uh, although, again, there are uh, provisions in South Korea uh, and we are seeing enforcements for non-compliance in Singapore even within the last few months. And Malaysia's law carries not only enforcement and fines, but also prison sentences for directors and officers who have failed to manage personal information. In terms of the enforcement regime, uh, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has perhaps got the reputation of being uh, the biggest enforcer, and so an example is the $22.5 million uh, penalty against Google. Compare that with the EU. Our highest fine was in the last 12 months by the Portuguese authority of $4.5 million against a Portuguese telco. Uh, as yet in Asia, we haven't seen significant fines, but as I say, prison sentences uh, does get the board's attention. So let's look specifically at the <coughs> EU. There are uh, eight principles in the EU of which I have put four here, and I briefly mentioned one of them, data retention. We can't keep data in Europe longer than is necessary. Data subjects have rights to know what we are processing about them and to have any inaccurate data corrected. And if we believe the right to be forgotten will continue, uh, the right to be erased. It's this third bullet point that is important for businesses. If you are caught by the European law as a data controller, you have to have technical and organizational measures in place appropriate to the sensitivity of the personal data that you're processing. And in addition, you need training. Uh, failure to show the regulator when things go wrong that you have trained your staff and indeed done due diligence on your third-party cloud providers ups the ante uh, and the fines when things go wrong. And then that fourth bullet point I've mentioned before is the restriction on transferring personal data outside the EU or the European Economic Area, to be exact, which, of course, happens almost inevitably once you use a public cloud because there's inevitably some form of global transfer. So what's coming down the track? Well, we've got this new regulation which is currently being debated in the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers and the European Commission which is a regulation and will replace the directive. And being a regulation will be immediately applicable in every member state without local law needing to be enacted. When? Well, we think we shall see some detailed wording by the end of this year, but probably not uh, a final enforcement of the law until 2017. I said I would mention some definitions. Uh, perhaps these should have been at the beginning, but let's do them here. When we talk about processing personal data in the EU, we mean virtually every adjective you can think of to describe doing something with somebody's personal information. And currently, it's the data controller that is directly liable for compliance and non-compliance. Whereas, in fact, the data processor, in other words, the cloud provider, isn't necessarily caught by the law because at the moment the law does not apply to a data processor. And that means right now data controllers really need to focus on their relationship with third parties, particularly cloud providers. And so I've just put here, and I won't go through this in detail, some of the things you need to think about whether you're a data controller or a data processor and or a data processor. And perhaps the most important for me when we're advising controllers on using cloud is doing due diligence on the cloud provider. What are their information security standards? How do they manage personal data? How do they stop you, the data controller, being caught by 
at their breach. In this new brave world, the new framework in the EU, most businesses are going to have to have a compulsory or mandatory data protection officer uh, who's going to have to be appropriately qualified and trained and who has the task of monitoring compliance, conducting the audits, uh, reporting data breaches. And there is a catch for businesses that have to appoint a data protection officer. Uh, they are protected employees and can't be dismissed for convenience, but they're also your internal whistleblower because it's they who report the business to the regulator when there is non-compliance, not just when there's a data breach. I wanted to just talk about these phrases, anonymization and pseudonymization. Uh, our Information Commissioner's Office says that anonymization is the process of turning data into a form which does not identify individuals and where re-identification is not likely to take place. And it, it's, it's a good company uh, that can be sure that anonymization truly does not achieve uh, re-identification. Pseudonymization from the word pseudonym allows the removal of an association with a data subject, and it differs from anonymization in that it allows data to be linked to the same person across multiple data records or information systems without revealing the identity of the person. It's particularly used in the health sector, hence I have quoted the international uh, standard uh, from the, uh, for health informatics, which contains that definition of pseudonymization. And then de-identification and key coding. Uh, de-identification refers uh, to um, scrubbing the identifiable elements of personal data, making it safe in privacy terms whilst attempting to retain its commercial and scientific value, particularly useful in big data and big analytics. Uh, the US HIPAA Act uh, defines data as de-identified if it does not identify an individual with respect to which there is no reasonable basis to believe that the information can be used to identify an individual that is not individually identifiable health information. I just also put something on there about coded information, and really the purpose for going through these definitions was that one way of avoiding concerns around compliance with data privacy laws is to make sure that personal data is not personal data. And therefore, if these techniques can be used uh, through a vendor, then it significantly minimizes your risk. One of the big issues is when there is a data breach in the new framework, we anticipate when it comes in in 2017, if there is a breach, the regulator will need to be notified without undue delay but effectively within 72 hours, that's going to place a huge pressure on data controllers to have appropriate systems in place to be able to react to an issue, whether it's the data controller that's the cause of the breach or whether the breach occurred in the cloud and is the problem of both the data controller and the cloud vendor. And then individuals, rather like in the US, will need to be notified if there's likely to be significant damage as a result of the breach. There's still a lot to be uh, produced in terms of guidance on how this will operate, uh, but it is going to happen whether it will be 72 hours or perhaps a more reasonable period, we have yet to see. And then here's the other eye-watering figure. Uh, under the new framework in Europe, if the breach is egregious or significantly negligent, then there is the potential of fines on the data controller of up to 5% of annual worldwide turnover. Um, and there may be, uh, without notice investigations, otherwise known as dawn raids. And the level of the fine will be, will be uh, subject to the degree of security put in place to protect the data, whether it's by data by protection by design or by default, the security of the processing uh, and your compliance reviews. I have one more slide to finish on, and that's just to talk about almost what I started with, 
cyber security, cyber espionage, uh, there is, uh, much like the NIST standards in the U.S. as part of the Obama executive order, a cyber security directive now in the EU, which will come into force in 2015 as each member state passes laws, which particularly for those that are in critical infrastructure businesses or companies, means they're going to have to significantly increase their information security to manage the risk of nation state hacking, uh, anonymous hacking, uh, and plain operator error breaches, um, whether sponsored by uh, a third party or not. And the Cybersecurity Directive cross-references the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, and these two are dragging themselves along. And there is a third directive to just mention, which isn't on the slide, and that's the EU Trade Secrets Directive, which again is saying businesses need to be aware that cyber espionage is a growing nation state issue where what is being acquired unlawfully is not necessarily personal data, but is business secrets and business information. And these big changes are not about just the EU, but we're seeing similar approaches in Canada and similar approaches in Africa and Asia. So the pressure is on us who use personal data to protect not only individuals, but also ourselves by considering what technology is out there to, to minimize the risks of managing personal data in the cloud or indeed anywhere. Um, and with that, I'm going to finish my presentation. Um, I'll be happy to take questions as they are emailed in, but I'll now hand back to our moderator. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, your presentation was very eye-opening. So next, we'll, uh, we'll have Tarek Al-Jilani uh, take over and talk to us about uh, CloudMask. Uh, Tarek? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Robert, again. And, um, uh, so thanks again, everybody, for attending uh, the webinar. Um, what I'd like to do is talk first about uh, the general security challenges that are facing us today, um, especially in the light of the, um, all of the different um, challenges that uh, Robert was explaining. And then we can talk after that about how Cloud Mask is addressing these challenges. Uh, but first, just a quick background about Cloud Mask. We are a data and uh, collaboration, a data protection company focusing on collaboration, especially in light of um, concern about data privacy uh, and data sovereignty in both uh, public and pri private cloud applications. Um, the way the company uh, started is we, um, we had a, a fairly unique offering of a security solution, and we won um, a program here in Canada where we started, which is called the Canada Innovation Commercialization Program. Uh, it's uh, basically a procurement-based process, a competitive process. Uh, where we won based on innovative, and as a result of this uh, competitive process, we were uh, implemented and uh, eventually certified for use within the federal government uh, in Canada. Um, the reason why certification is fairly important when we talk about it um, is anonymization um, is very important, but not all anonymization is created equal. You want to make sure uh, through certification and independent audits that the solution that uh, is actually offering this is indeed providing an algorithm that is not reversible, that somebody uh, with intent and, and capability uh, cannot reverse the actual uh, anonymized data or tokenized data. Uh, and in, in this slide, we actually went through extensive certification with the Government of Canada uh, in order to be able to be cleared to a secret level of data, which is much higher level than most of the data uh, today that most organizations are dealing with. Um, but we also went through a program called the Common Certification Criteria, Common Criteria Certification, which is a government-sponsored uh, standard that's recognized by 26 different countries, uh, especially, and it obviously uses a lot of the algorithms, same algorithms that are used for military purposes and, and um, information that deals with secret data. So I want to jump ahead and talk exactly about the problem we're trying to focus on. Uh, now, one of the challenges we face when we talk about security is that there are a lot of different uh, security products out there. Uh, each of them, uh, in some um, in some ways, actually complementary or focusing on a different aspect of the problem. 
What's really new, though, is uh, the push for using cloud computing environment and how it actually uh, traverses geographical boundary. And really, as, uh, as Robert was explaining, how the problem is now I, as a controller of the data, I'm the person who's liable and make sure, wants to ensure the privacy of the data. If I want to leverage cloud computing, I have to give custody of that data to uh, a processor of this same piece of information. So if this represents my enterprise boundary where I traditionally kept all of my private data, as an enterprise, I have a vested interest to benefit from the economies of scale and all the functionality and the benefits of cloud computing, whether this is something as simple as box and file storage or a full-blown business application such as Salesforce or SAP and so forth. But in, in the process of doing that, now my data is not just within my own enterprise boundary where I can control and have established the traditional security approach of just protecting my that build fences around it, but I'm actually sharing it outside with that cloud vendor. And that cloud vendor is in the business of putting the data where it's most economically feasible, where they can make the highest, uh, where they can lower their operational cost to make, to offer better service and increase their margin as well. So that means it's very difficult for me as a controller of the data to mandate to the cloud vendor to enforce, tell them, no, you have to keep the data in certain geographical region. Uh, I have to be able to audit your, uh, the, all of your employees. In theory, it's possible, but it drastically increases the cost and it no longer becomes the commodity-based cloud offering that we're familiar with. So you lose a lot of the benefits once we start adding all of these restrictions on the cloud provider. So. The problem is further compounded when we talk about who, which actually, who is actually consuming the data. So we have internal users within the enterprise, but we also have external users that actually could also be in different geographical locations. These could be customers and partners, and we want to make sure that we can control when they get access to the data, who is actually sharing it with and how they're getting this access. So there are certain constraints in collaboration as well that needs to be enforced. And obviously, needless to say, because that's uh, the theme of the whole presentation, there is different privacy regulation, and uh, Robert explained them very in, uh, in a lot of details, that I, as a controller of the data, have to be conscious of and I have to make sure that I'm not exposing myself to a risk of uh, not following any of these regulations. But in addition to these regulations, there's also a traditional risk that I want to protect, uh, not just the privacy of my information, but also competitive information, uh, citizen data, and so forth. So, we have to worry about outsider threats. Now, they're not just attacking my own private network, but also they could be attacking any of these cloud applications. And in addition, there is also the government, uh, different foreign governments as well as local governments that could get access to that private information without having access to, um, to my own private network directly from the cloud environment. And finally, there is insiders. Now, insider threat was always uh, an issue for within enterprises. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very difficult one to address, but it's further compounded by the fact that now there's also the additional insiders within the cloud providers that are offering this uh, software as a service and different solutions that I'm consuming. So really, if you look at this picture, one way to summarize from an information management perspective, one way to summarize the, uh, the overall challenge is how do I make sure that independent of where the data is or which application is being moved to, how do I make sure that I as a controller stay in control? That it could be processed by these commodity-based cloud computing environments, but even though it's being su successfully processed, I still maintain control of who can see which piece of information at any given point in time. So that's where really Cloud Mask um, is focused on. So what we do, is we take um, our solution basically focuses on, as we explained, on anonymizing the data using different encryption methodologies. So that's one aspect is actually the data before it leaves the end user device, the person who actually is creating it, um, it's already been uh, um, anonymized in such a way that it's not reversible to whether the cloud vendor or any, anybody else even within my own private network. The second principle is the idea of zero trust. That means basically that we need to share that data. But sharing the data does not mean that I have to have implicit trust in an organization or in a cloud provider or even in my own system administrator or even cloud mask administrator in this case. Everybody who has access to the data has to be explicitly named 
and there has to be a reason why they need to see that data, which is a commonly uh, a common principle in defense, which is basically you hear you may have heard about need to know basis, uh, and that's really one of the key um, principles that Cloud Mask implement. The last element is policy control. When we start talking about many applications, many devices, many users, information moving all around the world, to enforce it, to be able to manage it, and especially going, going back to the idea of a data protection officer that Robert was talking about, you have to have a strong central point where you can, the, the protection officer can set the policies, audit it, and monitor what's going on so they can see any red alerts. Now, one of the key uh, aspects I want to mention here the role of the officer and the policy control is a purely uh, a compliance role. It's not an IT role. It has to be somebody who represents the owner of the data or the controller of the data and setting the policy according. It's not up to the IT to decide on it. And we don't assume in, in this model, uh, much like any other cloud offering, that there has to be an internal IT expertise in order to, for that model to be delivered. It's, the control is all based on need-to-know basis, including who can actually set the policies for who can see which piece of information. So with this in mind, if I, take, if I look back at the same picture we had before and apply Cloud Mask, the picture changes as follows. The blacked out pieces of information are basically the data in process, whether it's internal within my private network or at the cloud vendor. The data itself is only restored to its true meaningful information, uh, and thus you can get this private information only as when it reaches the end user devices, whether it's an external user an internal user or another application I may have existing within my own private network. So what that means is whether the data, even if the data is breached, whether within my own private network or it's breached within the, um, the cloud vendor, uh, either legally or if there is a, a foreign government or a government agency that decided to um, order the cloud vendor to disclose that information, what they will get, they will get this anonymized piece of information instead of its true meaningful in information. Uh, another key point here that I would mention, and I think I'm going to go ahead and show you a demo so you can actually visualize what we're, how, how this works in real life, is that the concept of anonymization, one of the key uh, aspects of it, it has to be fairly accessible. So that means I have to be able to implement it without asking the cloud vendor to change their application to accommodate me. I also got to be able to implement it as I move from one application to another. Uh, and it has to be independent of which network I'm connected to, because most people, when they collaborate, they collaborate across the, gro uh, across the globe, and they're not constrained, constricted to one um, you know, network they may believe it's more secure than another. So with this, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, show you a demo, and then we can go back and discuss a little bit more uh, information. So what you, uh, you should be able to see my browser right now. Um, what I have here is a, I'm a normal user using a regular browser, and I'm using this browser has my Cloud Mask credential, the, the engine that performs the anonymization and encryption and, and checks my identity and so forth. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to use as an example Salesforce as an example business application. The way I'm using Salesforce when I loaded it, uh, I'm using it just like uh, anybody else. Uh, Salesforce is not aware that I as uh, Tarek has anything uh, special happening. I can use the system as usual. I can open that record as usual. So this is a, a list of accounts. I have the account name, account number, so forth. So it looks a normal Salesforce site, and there, there is nothing really special except I have a browser. I'm connected to a standard Salesforce application. But look what happens if I take the same exact URL and go to another browser. So now I'm, I'm going outside of the Cloud Mask uh, credentials that I have, and I try to load that same page. So I'm going to log into Salesforce as usual. Now, what you see here, instead of the actual information, we saw account name, account number, and so forth, you see these, these random strings. These basically are examples of tokens or anonymized data. And they're done in such a way that every time I type the same word, it comes up to a different random string, so that somebody who has access to my full information within Salesforce would not be able to reverse it back to its true uh, meaningful information. The same is true, and you see it respects different formats, whether it's a URL, email, and so on. But it also applies it for attachments. So if I scroll down here, you see a list of attachments also been uh, encrypted. Now, if I go back to my normal site that has Cloud Mask in it and scroll down, 
this is the same list of files. If I open that file here, it will ask me to open it and save it as usual. So it works properly as usual. The difference is if I go back to outside of my Cloud Mask credentials and try to open that same URL, it tells me fail to load the PDF. Now, this is what somebody inside Salesforce will be able to see is all these tokens and encrypted payloads. Even if somebody was to inspect the data in process within Salesforce servers and infrastructure, that's all they would see. And that's because the data has already been uh, anonymized uh, and encrypted before it leaves the memory space of my browser. Now, the policies are what tells me who I'm sharing with and who I'm authorized to share with. So I'm not the only one who can actually see this record. Based on the policy that's defined by the data protection officer, when I create a record here, there's a list of recipients that are explicitly named that do have access information because they have a need to know basis or, and it, it follows the zero trust model we were talking about earlier. Now, one of the common questions we get is what happens if you're randomly uh, tokenizing everything and anonymizing the data? How would you think like searching, reporting, and so on? So one, one unique feature we did in Cloud Mask as well is we actually have our own uh, secure search functionality. So if I click search and type the word Hydro here, you see that it comes back as usual and it's finding all the matches. And it's finding these matches even though the word Hydro itself has different random tokens every time it occurs. So if I click, click this one, for example, and show you the view hierarchy, right? you'll see here that the system maintained the relationship between each of these uh, accounts, which, one, which contact reports to who and which account is under which account. And that's an example of another challenge with encryption is you have to do it in such a way that it has to be selective to maintain the functionality of the system. So what CloudMass does is actually intelligent. Uh, we have our own uh, patent algorithm that basically can identify which piece of information is truly private that has to be protected and what other piece of information or just data that has to be left alone for the function, for the application to function as, as usual without disclosing any private information. If I take that same URL just to highlight this and go back here. You see here the word hydro occurs in all of these, but each one of them had a different random string. So every time you're typing the same word, it's, it's, that's, what, that's what makes the algorithm much, much stronger, and that's how we're able to achieve the certification that we, uh, we mentioned earlier. Now, another example I'm going to go quickly here is reporting. So that's an example of a report. If I go here to my contact report, and you see it looks, again, the usual, but I want to export it to a spreadsheet, so I'll download it as an Excel spreadsheet. You'll see it looks, everything looks as usual. Now, let me do the same thing again if I was a Salesforce insider or somebody who somehow compromised or breached my account. See, the first thing you see that all of this information is still tokenized. If I export the details here to the spreadsheet, <clears throat> And you see that's how the report actually looks like. So the system is smart enough to intercept spreadsheets or different uh, integration points if you have your, your own existing application within your network um, to resolve the tokens and give you back access to it. Again, based on, again, need to know basis and the fact that I'm a user that's trusted to run this report. The other thing I wanna quickly is we sh we're showing Salesforce now, but obviously, as I mentioned, it's not specific to one application. So if I wanna go, for example, and do a very simple example where I'm using a commodity, basically, email like Outlook.com. As you see, if you may have noticed, that it actually resolved the data as I'm loading it. If that's my inbox. If I take that same URL, again, go to my other browser that does not have Cloud Mask. That's how my emails would have looked like if somebody does not have the proper credentials. So if somebody, an insider within Microsoft or a government agent has access to all of Microsoft database or somebody who breached the network and can see the data in memory, that's what they will see in this scenario. Um, so I can go ahead now and I'll send a simple email test message.
I'll insert the file attachment. So as you can see, I'm using a system as normal. There's no visible difference to me as an end user. Even though behind the scene as I'm doing this, the system is actually checking who am I sharing the information with, and it's encrypting the data as well as so anonymizing the information as I'm sending it. If I click Send there, and then go to my Send folder, you see there's a message created here, 1043 Ottawa time. If I go back to the the system does not have my cloud mask credential, click on the send. This is how the message looks like, 1043. The subject, the body, and obviously the, the payload has also been encrypted. Now, I'll go ahead in the interest of time here, I'll just go ahead and send this message. I already sent it actually, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to, just again to highlight, go let's say to Gmail, another commodity-based email, right? So you see here the message is received as usual. I can, instead of opening it, I can actually save it to my G drive. Right, or I can download it, and if I go back here to G drive. Right, this is the file I just added 1044 here, and I can download that file. Right, this is a file that we actually uploaded. And if I just, just for reference, if I go back here, uh, I don't wanna to take too much time on this demo anymore, but uh, if I go back to the file that we were looking at initially, and I open it, you see here that the file name itself has been also uh, encrypted. And if I save it and open it, it will tell me fail to load because the payload itself has also been encrypted. So the, 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 the key message here is it's not application specific and it's always based on the end user credential independent of before it leaves the device. Now, I'm sure you may have a few questions about this, but I'll go ahead and, um, and talk quickly about a case study, and then we can, I think after that, we'll move on to uh, questions. So the example case study here is based on a, a firm that basically has um, um, an order of 1,000 employees, and they would have the typical scenario where they wanna be able to collaborate. They have a mix of cloud application that they're using, uh, software server, it's Box and Office 365 and Salesforce, but they also have internal uh, assets and applications that they wanna be able to integrate with. Uh, they were worried about two things, how, do we kept, how are we able to capitalize the cloud computing environment without compromising our customers' data, but also how do we protect against even breaches to our own private network as well. So the assumption here is that um, when we say that a hacker is existing and active, is that by protecting the data at its source at the moment of its creation, even if the network is breached or the server is breached, the data itself is still protected. And obviously, as, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's very important to be able to have a control point to be able to audit and track what's going on and, and uh, detect anomalies, uh, especially in the case of your word also about insiders, not just outsider threats. So as a result of implementing something similar to what we actually demoed, um, it basically, because of the increased security, they were able to leverage, uh, improve their, um, their risk, lower their cost because they can leverage commodity-based uh, software as a service. But they also increased productivity and confidence because now the end user felt that the system is more secure and they can leverage for more and more data that, uh, without having to be worried about it. And obviously the compliance is one of the key aspects there where they improved it, where they were able to meet the compliance requirements. The picture of how this case study looks like is if I have a typical uh, a firm that has these different um, offices across different uh, continents and the globe. And I also have clients that want to, they may be also geographically dispersed. And I want to be able to collaborate with them using software as service applications such as Google, Dropbox, Salesforce, and the like. And depending on which case is being managed, the actual sharing and permissions are done on folder or file or case basis, basically. So each case has a folder uh, which contains this information in it. And the people basic, using that zero trust model or need to know basis, only those authorized to see a given case can see that piece of information, even though they all are sharing the same commodity-based software, um, software as a service solutions. So whether you have case A or case B, there may be overlaps between them, but ultimately everybody who's seeing a, a piece of information within a given case has to, ha has to have been authorized by the, a data officer to do so. 
So that's really the, the key message here. I think the last slide here is more of a summary of more technical features. Um, we spoke to many of them already. Basically, idea of being user-centric, so everything is based on the end-user need-to-know basis. Application neutral, that's very important because we don't want to go to the cloud vendor and ask them to change their environment to accommodate us. Uh, also, a very much control point that has to be a strong policy management auditing point. And obviously, as part of auditing, we could also integrate with existing uh, advanced security event manager systems that some enterprises already have in place. Finally, um, this, the offering itself uh, has two models, on-premise as well as cloud-based. Both of them are certified for the same security level. So that allows um, smaller offices and uh, to leverage our solution without having to do investments or set up special service deployments and VPNs and the likes. I think with this, I'd like to pass it back to, um, to the moderator, and then we can uh, open it for questions. Thank you very much, Tariq. Okay, and now we'll uh, open it up for uh, questions. Um, we have a few questions here that came uh, out of band. So this is a question to both uh, Robert and Tariq. Uh, we are a global company that operates in uh, different uh, juris jurisdictions, and we need to have global collaboration. What, is, uh, what are your comments on our situation from both the legal perspective, a policy perspective, and a technology perspective? So I guess uh, I'll start with you, Robert. Can you comment on the question? Yes, of course. Um, when it comes to a sort of global collaboration, um, it's for, you need to do some assessment of the countries which you're operating in where you have legal entities uh, or affiliates or subsidiaries in a country that has a restricted a restrictive data privacy law like, say, the EU, or indeed like uh, Singapore or Malaysia or South Korea, uh, or indeed Canada um, or Argentina, you need to be thinking, do we need to put in place some compliance program, uh, appropriate policies and training and contractual solutions to allow us to do what we need to get on and do in business, which is to collaborate and share data, particularly if it's personal data. And usually our approach for multinationals is to look at whether we can put some group sharing agreement in place that will be acceptable to those regulators that need to review it or have it filed with them and then also to put in place the necessary uh, information security and other policies and procedures to make the contractual solution fully robust. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Tarek? Uh, I think that the, the question of collaboration is a very important one, and that's, uh, that's one of the key things that we focus on in CloudMask. Um, Using, uh, in my opinion, using uh, ready-made uh, software such as uh, the tools available on the cloud to perform collaboration gives you uh, much better functionality and scalability and other aspects than uh, trying to build it in-house. The challenge has always been how do you protect the privacy of the information, whether it's uh, customers or even your own internal competitive information. Uh, and I think that's really been the primary focus of CloudMask is to enable you to do that collaboration, meet the compliance requirements while leveraging um, commodity, the commodity-based software through uh, this transparent intelligence anonymization that uh, we have been referring to. Thank you very much. Uh, can, can you I, mention, I'm sorry? Can, it's Robert again. Can I just add something to that? I was, just thinking, I was thinking that if you have something like CloudMask as a default uh, security solution, it also deals with the, the operator error that we often get, which is where somebody is sending something sensitive to a colleague within the same office or indeed another office in another part of the world, you know, auto-completes the email address and sends the wrong thing to the wrong person, um, at least if it's encrypted or, or anonymized, then there is no breach. Uh, but in the real world, at the moment, without that solution, we're finding, you know, once you've sent the wrong information or the right information to the wrong person, it's not like a product recall. You can't get it back. It's gone. 
Right, and and one other thing I want to mention because I think Robert, you you mentioned the presentation as well. It's again Tarek, is the idea of uh, being able to destroy the data or the right to forget. So one of the things that also Cloud Mask can uh, can help with is that once the data is all over different, as you collaborate, it's going to go from one application to another. Um, using the Cloud Mask policy enforcement, you can with one click disable all access or destroy that data, independent of which application it's actually residing in. That's another control point we, I, I, I probably should have mentioned earlier. Uh, thank you. Actually, this, uh, this next question is kind of an offshoot of what you both mentioned. Uh, this question is addressed to you, Robert. Um, in your presentation, you, you outlined some very complex and, uh, quite frankly, scary responsibilities for the data controllers, the, the clients of cloud software. Um, if we are using anonymization software or policies, for example, encryption, and the, da the data is no longer uh, considered personal data according to the definitions you outlined, do I still need to review the cloud provider contracts and, and other complex processes to make sure I'm compliant? Or will this allow me to bypass all of these? That's a very good question. Um, I would still say that you need to at least carry out some due diligence on whether the, the, whether the person that you're using, the organization you're using in the cloud, uh, has in place adequate security, training, et cetera, because, um, and this is the lawyer, the jaundiced view of the lawyer, um, I would prefer to both have anonymized and done the due diligence just in case the worst happens and something does get through uh, and a regulator says, well, you may have tried to anonymize it, but look what's happened and yet you did no due diligence. You had no contractual controls in place with your, with your cloud provider or your third party host. So what you're saying is we should have multiple layers of protection, essentially. Correct. Yes. Okay. This next question is for you, Tarek. Uh, you mentioned the uh, zero trust uh, several times in the in the presentation. How can we uh, accept and trust the Cosmos claim of being secure? That's an excellent point. Uh, one of the key key things that we've uh, invested a lot of um, effort in is. Uh, these independent certification. One of them I mentioned is uh, it's probably the most prestigious one available today, which is Common Criteria Certification that's accepted by 26 countries, including the U.S., uh, many of the leading European nations. Um, and it's really going down the same certification path and validating that every uh, piece of software, every component, the way it manages keys, the way it's actually performing the encryption, the way it manages memory, very detailed analysis to make sure that it meets uh, very um, strict requirements that uh, military requirements. And that's how today governments purchase a lot of their security products. So we're using the same methodology to demonstrate that the software itself is written in such a way that it doesn't have backdoor, doesn't have these holes in order to um, to demonstrate that you don't have to trust uh, us in the, just cloud mass, trust the certifier auditing agency. Thank you. Um, Tarek, this is against you. Can you give us an idea of the, the cost and the time needed to implement Cloud Mask? Uh, sure. So in terms of time, uh, our cloud-based offering um, basically allows um, companies who are using uh, uh, common available software like Box, uh, Salesforce, and the likes to be set up in order of uh, minutes, like the data officer probably will take a little bit longer than may take an hour to set up the system, and then each user takes an order of a few minutes. Uh, but we don't have any uh, upfront capital investment or deployment cost. It's a cloud-based offering. So the model in terms of cost is that uh, once you're up and running, there is a monthly subscription per user basis. And obviously, depending on the volume and so on and the application and, and uh, the use case, it may range from as low as $5 to as high as $15 per month per user. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so this, uh, this brings us to the end of the webinar. We still have a few minutes left. If there's anyone that has any other questions, please uh, don't hesitate to ask in the QA uh, panel. And uh, just so you know, uh, this, uh, this uh, webinar was recorded, and we will send a copy to, of the recording to everyone that participated. Uh, so don't worry, you can watch this again if you'd like. Uh, so again, we still have a few minutes. Feel free to ask any questions in the QA panel. Uh, again, if you don't remember, there is a little QA button at the top right of your screen. If you press that, little panel pops up and you can type in your question and we will have it answered.
Uh, so again, we had another question coming to us out of Van. Uh, this one is again for you, Tarek. Um, we right now we don't have any uh, identification system, whether it's uh, whether it's by certificates or or other other identification system. Will we have to implement something like that, especially for a small shop that doesn't have many much IT expertise to use? Um, and not necessarily. So we provide different options. Um, for larger enterprises that do have uh, identity management system, we uh, tend to integrate with these systems. Uh, but for a very simple use, uh, for a simple environment, uh, we actually have a built-in, as, as you enroll users, we, we create their credentials, their strong credentials and their keys, and it's basically embedded within Cloud Mask. So the people don't have to invest from an operational perspective to, to worry about that aspect of identity management. Okay. So that brings us to the end of time. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Uh, we very much appreciate you guys joining us, and uh, we hope we hear from you guys again. Thank you. Bye-bye.